lift your hands and I want you to tell the Lord something beautiful today. I want you to tell him something lovely. For me, it's I love you, Jesus. I just want to dwell in your presence. I just want to be with you forever and ever. And I want to worship forever. What is your cry? What is the cry on your heart tonight?
is your name. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. Whoa. situation comes alive because of your name. Your, somebody say the name of Jesus. Say your name. Your name. Say your name. Your name. we do it healing our wounds style. It's my first healing our wounds and I'm so happy to be here. I truly consider it a privilege to be coming to you in your homes as you sit in front of your television, as you sit in front of your smart television, that is, you sit in front of your computer, as you sit in front of your phone. Let it be known that our God, he works Wherever we are, virtual space, physical space, he's there with you right now. You know, I'm, I'm glad that you made the appointment, whether it's your first time or you're a regular. I want to give a shout out to all the regulars who year after year after year, you come to healing our wounds. And I also want to just take a moment to acknowledge our pastors, our senior pastors, pastors Junior and Trudy Tucker, and also pastors Andrea McCurdy and Pastor Colleen Davis. I want to say thank you so much for all you do for us, including being faithful and committed to having a conference like Healing Our Wounds, where as women we can come together. Well, you know, somebody is going to have to give the message to Pastor Junior and Pastor Colleen because guys are not allowed. It's a girl's evening when we get to sit with our father, we get to sit with each other, and the Lord really ministers unto us. So if there's a guy peering over your shoulder, just know, say, I love you, but girls only. I had to say girls only to my husband, Sean, because it's a girls only evening. So it's, I think it's so appropriate that healing our wounds, the acronym spells how, how. And if you think about it, sometimes we're walking around with wounds. We don't know how, how they're going to be healed. In fact, we don't even know how, how we got there. And so it is with our relationships that so often we don't know how. We don't know what happened to what was a great relationship. And now I'm not in love anymore. And now not only am I not in love anymore, but I don't even like you. What happened? I think this is a great place for us to take our house because I believe the Lord wants to speak into our house. How do I get healed from this betrayal, Lord? How do I have peace restored in my house? How do I stop this rivalry within me, within my family, how? I had a how conversation recently myself, a very difficult conversation with a friend of mine. We don't quite know how we got there. How did we get to a place when after years and years and years of friendship, of being there for each other in bad times and good times and pouring out our hearts and you know, being vulnerable, here we were saying to each other on the phone, actually, I don't know if we want to be friends anymore. I don't know. I don't know if you want to continue this, you know. We don't know how we got there. And so it is with so many of our relationships, 
We don't know how we get there. For us, I believe that there are things that happen in rivalry. And although we don't label it rivalry, there are all these remnants and these vices associated with rivalry, and they're at play in our relationships. And for us, it was, well, I had an expectation that you would do that and you didn't do it. And she had an expectation that I would do that and I didn't do it. And we didn't have the conversation. We just let it, you know, make it stay, make, make it stay. And so things started to seep in. Same things that seep in when there's rivalry. And there we were on the phone. You know one of those conversations? You ever had one of those conversations where you're emotionally drained? Sometimes it's a crying conversation. Sometimes, it, you know, it's, there's crying and there's high emotion and there's anger and there's all this upset. For us, it was this very quiet one. But when it was done, we, all, we both had that what just happened to us there. And so I don't know where you are. I don't know if something has hit you in your relationship and you have some questions. You want to understand how it could happen and what could I do to ensure this doesn't happen to my relationships again? Is there something in the word of God to guide me on this? And so I want to encourage you to let's look at the word and see what God has to say to us on this topic of relationship, not rivalry. Turn your Bibles with me to Genesis 4, verses 3 to 10. And while you're turning to Genesis 4, verses 3 to 10, I want to give you a bit of background. We're in the Garden of Eden just before that. And mankind is not having a great time, not doing very well with God. Their relationship problems left, right, center. There is deception and rivalry and disobedience and blame because there is a broken relationship between God and man. And then there are relationship problems between Adam and Eve because Adam and Eve are now on the blame thing. No, 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 God, it wasn't me, it was her. It was her, it was him. Do we know that? We see that in our homes. And so here we are now, it's down to the children. Isn't it like that sometimes? That at very various levels, our relationship with God is broken, our relationship with our spouse. The next thing you know, the whole household is in turmoil. And so by the time we get to Genesis 4, verses 3 to 10, what we are seeing is Cain and Abel. They've grown up, but they have bro grown up in a broken world, a world where bad things happen, where evil has taken root. But God still has some kind of relationship with mankind, you see. And so as God is engaging in this relationship with mankind, these brothers have come to bring their sacrifice to God. They've come to say, Father, we give you thanks. And one is a farmer who is rearing grown provisions, and one is a shepherd, and they are taking their sacrifices to God. And so in verse 3, it says, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, I hear your brother's blood crying out to me from the ground. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are here right now. We we thank you, Lord, that you know every single one of us, each of your girls, each of your daughters, Lord. You know where we are in our relationships. 
Lord, even as people are taking a moment to just think about their own relationships, you already know, Lord. Father, we thank you that you care and you feel the emotions that we've been feeling over this. You feel the disappointment. You feel, oh God, the very kind of confusion that we have in our relationships. And Lord, you wanna, you wanna help us, Lord. Sometimes we've been going about it the wrong way, Lord, but we don't know what to do. We don't know where to go. Sometimes, Lord, we've been using what we saw our, our mom or our father do, or our sisters, our brothers, our friends do, Lord. Maybe we've been Googling it, Lord, and it's not working. And so, Father, we need miracles today. We need your Holy Spirit to come today. We need a specific word of direction and truth from you because you are trustworthy, Lord, and you speak truth. And so speak your truth into us today, Lord. Break open your word, Lord, and speak to each one of us. So, Lord, speak to me. Speak to us, Lord. Lord, I just yield. I yield, Lord. Take anything that's in the way right now, Lord, and just remove it, Lord, so you can talk to your daughters. We drop a chair, Jesus. We're ready, Lord. We see our names at the banquet table, Lord, and we're ready to partake of what you have for us. Speak to us, Father. We're listening. Amen. A title of the words I'm going to share, the words of encouragement I'm going to share with you today is Stop Raising Cain. Stop Raising Cain. I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear Stop Raising Cain, but I hope it's not sugar cane because you know. Certainly here in Jamaica, we, we're, and here in this meeting, we're not focused on sugar cane, not in this moment. Perhaps when you hear stop raising cane, has anybody ever spoken about somebody raising cane in the house, behaving badly, losing it? That's some of where we're getting at today. But before you get to the point where we get to the point, because some of us, we get there, where we're raising cane, where, where it's all out of control. There is a process that gets us to that place. And if we look at Cain's life, we'll realize that there is a Cain in us. And the question is, do we want to raise that Cain in us? Do we want to give fertile ground so that Cain in us can rise up and destroy everything in its path? Or is there another a way, another way? Today, I believe the Lord wants to tell us that raising Cain is not the way to go. That living in rivalry is not the way to go. That the vices that accompany rivalry, they're not for us. That's not going to get us to the solution that we want. We might be overwhelmed, but raising Cain is not the way to go. I think today the Lord wants to point us to instead having the mind of Christ. And so now let's look at why we should Stop raising Cain. I think sometimes when we hear stories like the story of Cain and Abel, it's God talking to man and it's God talking to man a long time ago. And perhaps we don't see how it would unfold in front of us. And so, you know, there's a Jamaican New Testament, but there is not a Jamaican Old Testament, that is a Patwa Bible. And so if you're here and you're from another country, bear with us for this moment that I can really go down into the Patwa because there are some things in Patwa that will allow us to bring this story to life so that we can see what's really going on and what it means to raise Cain. So we're gonna, I'm going to take some creative liberties and set the story of Cain and Abel in a family. And... There's a mother who is in this family, who heads this family. Is there anybody in the chat who you are the mother who heads the home? Anybody in this chat? Anybody on the Zoom who you can say you have two adult sons? Maybe you have three. Do you have adult sons? If you have adult sons, I want to see hands going up in the chat because you're going to be able to hear me and see me and help me right here as we try to bring this closer home. So. This is a story of what happened with Miss G. Miss G and our two sons, them, big boy, them, big boy name, Cain and Abel. So Miss G is there and the boy, them say, you know what? 
Why, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna go to mama and we're gonna just big her up and we care something for her for the sure or oh, we appreciate her, you know, because you know, say, oh, she deal with you, she take care of her, man. Yeah, man, we have to go big up mama. So, Abel now, Abel is the one who rear goat and some of nice goat kid on him, him get a goat kid in on him, say, yeah, man, this is for mama, so him carry it on him, kill it for Miss G. And Miss G say, yeah, this is nice. Me love how you go about everything, my son. This is good. K now. K now the one now. We go a grown. My farmer. And go get grown provision on him. Carry the grown provision there, man. And say, yeah, mama. Boy, my time for big you up now, no, mama. And see what me care for you, yeah, And mama look on it. Hmm. Mama say, you know, we do things a certain way around here. When you give a gift to the elder, it have to do certain way. You have to have certain attitude. Hmm, something off about how Cain thing set up. It not, it not right. So, mama said to Cain, say, Cain, my son, I'm not going to take the thing where you carry now. I'm not going to take it because you know in this family, oh, we, de we have a way of doing things. I mean, I think you deal with it the right way, son. So, I'm not going to take it. So, Cain feel a way about the thing. Cain feel a way about the thing. He said to himself, say, who do I deal with, sir? He said to himself, say, kiss up, kiss up him teeth and vex up, vex up him face and walk away. And Mr. G say, but Cain, where you going so far? Ain't yeah, no, none of you going so far. I'm going to tell you, say, if you deal with the thing the right and proper way, I'm going to tell you, say, me, we accept it. Cain, me, I warn you, you know, son. That attitude here is not good, you know, son. That attitude you're not going to get, you know, here. Son, sin outside of your door, it bend down and it's going to jump on your son and it's going to bring you down with it, son. Watch your attitude, son. All the talk, Miss G talked to Cain, it still not help Cain. Cain, have up Abel, Cain, so you see all the one, you see all the one, Abel. I, I, you true, you don't know, you know, true, you don't know, you know. Watch out for me and him. Watch out. I true, you don't know, you know. But have it up in my heart. Oh. So, he said to him, brother, say, boy, follow me go over ground there, you know, or get some things together. When him brother there over there, him jump on the little brother, and he killed the brother. Miss G stare yard and no one says something wrong. When time Cain come back and Miss G yard, Miss G say, Cain, where's your brother? Where Abel there? Cain say, we ask me, oh, we ask me about, about, about brother. I'm going to respond to him. You ask, ask me about brother. Miss G say, Cain, you kill your little brother? Cain, what that you do? Me hear him blow the ball out to me, Cain. What that you do? Cain, you are going to pay a price for this. I hope that has brought the story of Cain and Abel home. I hope that somebody on this chat can say, I've seen that play out in my house. I've seen that play out in my marriage. You know, maybe it wasn't mama, but the voice inside of me was saying, don't say that. Don't do that. Take it another way. Try it another way. D back off. Maybe you're saying, I'm innocent. I'm the evil in this situation. I was just doing what I was doing. I was praising God. I said, an argument. I don't business with it. I'm praising God. I'm worshiping God. I'm doing good. I give mama a present. Maybe you're saying, some of our family members, they are difficult to deal with. Some of our relationships, they are difficult to deal with. But can we agree that that path that Cain took is not the path for us? Can we agree that in our relationships, we have to stop raising Cain? We can't allow rivalry to sit in us and stir us and bother us and direct us and control us to the extent where so much in our life dies, where our families are disrupted, our inner peace is disrupted, our relationships become dysfunctional. 
I believe today God wants to take us somewhere else apart from the cane. He wants to take us to the mind of Christ. You know, there are some people who are listening who are avid competitors. Like there's a competition, girlfriend, call such and such. You know your girlfriend who, if you want to win, she's got to be on your team. Because she is so competitive. She is not going to stop and your team is surely going to win. And I know you're wondering. So Yvonne, when you talk about rivalry, you're not talking about me, right? And I say, I might not be talking about you, but you can judge for yourself. Because there's healthy competition, and then there's rivalry. In healthy competition, we are going after a prize. And the prize is the goal. And because it is a competition, one person winning affects one person losing. So there are some stakes, and somebody's going to gain, and somebody's going to lose. It moves from healthy competition to rivalry, when it's no longer about winning the prize. The prize is making sure that you lose. We're into rivalry when we're there. If there's an argument in your house, if you're having a discussion with your husband, you're having a discussion with your son, your daughter, and you get to the place where you, you don't really care about the case anymore, what point, what feeling, what background. You don't care about all of that. And only thing you care about is that you win this argument and that person loses this argument. This happens in our lives sometimes and we don't even realize it because that cane in us is so natural. So it just happens. But you want to know if you're on from competition to rivalry? Let's, go, let's take it to the workplace. So here you are. You're going after a job. And there are two of you going after this job. It's just one job. Somebody's going to win. Somebody's going to lose. So one of you gets the job. And it's, you know, it's been years since one of you has had that job. But between the two of you, there is still rivalry. When that email drop into your inbox, and you know she's working on that project, but me, share it with her. No, sir. Me. Does she have to go figure that out by herself? You know you're into rivalry when you're in that zone. You know you're into rivalry when that person who got that job is doing so well and you can't, you can't clap. You can't be happy. You know you're into rivalry, and this is one I've seen in my own life, and I have to look out for it, nip it in the bud. When your peers appear to be going ahead of you, and you say, boy, not now go on for me. But in addition to saying, not now go on for me, you can't be happy for them. When you're scrolling Instagram, we've got to just pay attention to what's going on into our hearts as well, because rivalry can be taking root in our heart. When you're in the same space, where you sing on the same choir, where you're in the same dance group, you dance better than me? You sing better than me? We have to be careful that rivalry doesn't take root. You see, we know that we are raising rivalry in our relationships when I am so happy for your downfall. Like somebody say, you know what happened to Swanzo? Oh, well, yeah. Now, ladies, I know that, you know, maybe you're not that girl. But we're still going to need this message because one day something's going to happen and we're going to have to remind ourselves to check ourselves to see what's being planted in our hearts. Because when that rivalry is planted in your heart and my heart, at the time, nobody sees it when it's being planted. But why, man, we water it and everything and wait until it comes out somewhere else. We don't want to make a home for rivalry. And so that's why Matthew 15 verse 19 tells us that we are to guard our hearts. It says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. 
And you know what? <laughs> We're okay sometimes with thinking, well, you know, I'm gonna kill nobody. Maybe can't kill somebody. Not me. <laughs> but you'd be surprised to know how it matters to God before it ever reaches to murder that the thought matters to God because he says he looks at our hearts. If we want our wounds to be healed and we want our relationships to grow, we've got to be looking at our hearts to see what's going on there. Today I want to just share three brief thoughts with you about why we shouldn't raise Cain in us, why we should stop within us that inclination towards rivalry. And the first point that I want to make is that rivalry is a natural part of relationships, but it is not right for our souls. Rivalry is a natural part of relationships, but it is not right for our souls. And so it is natural for all kinds of weeds to grow up in my garden. It is natural, but it's not good for the plant that I'm trying to nurture. And so we want to see that rivalry, because it's not good for our souls, it ends up with a certain outcome. We see it repeatedly. We see it in the story of Jacob and Esau, the rivalry between those brothers. We see it in the, the story of Joseph and his brothers who gets thrown into a pit and gets sold into slavery into Egypt. And even years and years and years later when he's reunited with his brothers, the pain, the tears that he cries before he's able to engage with them fully, that's rivalry. It's rivalry when you're no longer five and four where psychologists say, you know, it's natural to expect the children to, to have some rivalry because they're trying to ensure that they have the love of the, 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 the parent in the home. When you're 50, when you're 40, when you're 30, and there is still such rivalry between you and your siblings, we know that it's not going to come to a good end because it's not good for our souls. I think, though, that one of the biggest reasons that rivalry isn't good for our souls can be seen in the fact that rivalry breeds anger. And God don't go with anger. In fact, as I prepared, I really sensed the Lord wanting to have a word with us about angry, being angry, wanting us to understand how dangerous anger is, wanting us to understand that many of us are walking around with explosives. It's called anger. It's an explosive. And I want to ask you that if you had an explosive, if you have dynamite, if you strap it onto yourself, would we be walking around with it while we put on our nice Supergirl cape? And while, you know, we dress to the tea and we're ready for the day and while we're in the field working, while we're taking care of the kids, would we be walking around with that explosive strapped onto our bodies unless we're on a suicide mission? Today, I just want to remind us that we can be on suicide missions in our marriages because anger is all over, strapped onto us, spewing out of us, anger. And sometimes we feel like we have a right to that anger. Let it stay there because I am hurt. Let it stay. And I think today God wants to talk to us about walking around with anger. Yes, it's natural, it will happen, but it's what you do with it when it comes that matters. God called it out and pointed it out to, 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 to Cain. It was a warning, and I believe what God wants us to do with the anger is to get rid of it. Get rid of it. Everybody type it in the chat for me. Anger, get rid of it. Come on, we want to see that, because sometimes we need to see the words. Again, anger, get rid of it. I believe lovingly, even as the Lord patiently spoke to Cain, he's speaking to the Cain in us to say, anger, get rid of it. And I hear you saying, but how? But how? 
And I believe the Lord is going to open our eyes to that. Genesis 4 verse 5, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. Anger brought Cain to a place where it was okay to take the life of his brother. It might not be at the point of taking the life of another, but it's taking some other things, taking some other things, angry, angry we are. Sometimes it's everywhere. It's everywhere in, in the way we think and in what we do. And it's taking parts of our relationships, picking them apart, anger. So then why did God allow me to have this emotion? God has made a way to control this emotion. That's why you can have it. Because if you have the mind of Christ, we are now able to do things that in the natural we can't do. So Cain did things in the natural. And even though God beckoned him to say, take a spiritual path, he didn't. I believe God is beckoning you and beckoning me today. Because a circumstance, a situation is going to come up and it warrants anger. And when you feel that anger, you've got to note it. Because you, you have to realize, like, I'm human, so it came up. But the question is, what are you going to do with it? Don't keep it. It's an explosive. Get rid of it. Colossians 3, verses 8 and 9 says, But now, now, not tomorrow, now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, Malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Now is the time to get rid of anger. That's what God is saying. God is saying, now is the time to get rid of rage. Now is the time to get rid of malicious behavior. These are the things we see coming out of rivalry. Don't watch the label. You might be saying, I don't see any rivalry in what we're doing. Okay, don't look for the label. Look for the signs. Rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language, lack of self-control, impulsive, uncontrollable outbursts. It's there. It's all part of the clique. It's all part of the vices that comes with rivalry. But you know the one I really, really like? This one is like God has said to me, say, well, Yvonne, the next time you decide that you have righteous anger, <laughs> girl, you better just put it through the sift and pass it through this here verse before you decide if you have a right to it. And so the verse I want you to really look at is Matthew 5. And it's actually verses 21 to 24. And here's what Jesus says to us about anger. You have heard that our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. And so we go, Phew. hardly likely that I'm ever going to lose it enough to commit murder. Okay, well then let's go down to 22. But I say, if you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. That's what God is whispering to us. If you are even angry with someone, you are subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you are in danger of being brought before the court. And if you curse someone, you are in danger of the fires of hell. Looks like we've been playing with fire. We've been walking around with an explosive, my sisters. You know, when I speak to myself as I speak to you, it, for me it is a constant watch to see when passion becomes rage or passion becomes anger. We have to look out. We have to be alert. It's dangerous. It is a killer of relationships. And it's natural, but it's not right for our souls. I 
I want to talk to you just a little bit about even what your, your children see when they see how anger is treated in a household. I'm not a mom, but I interact with young adults quite a lot. And my little brother was much younger than myself, younger than me when we were growing up. And so I have a, a, a clear sense of our responsibility for the culture in our home. And do we want our children to be growing up with outbursts of anger? I can see a home where there are children who are distressed because of the anger in the home, the anger and the outbursts between parents. If you're in that home and that's become normal, today I want to tell you that Jesus heals wounds and he can heal the wounds that's causing that anger to take place. You know, the thing about anger is this, we have to make room for it. If we are vigilant about not making room for it, it has to go. And you know how sometimes we can be really firm about things that we're serious about. I think we're going to have to put anger higher up on the list of things that we're serious about. I know sometimes life gives us, deals us some blows and that in this evil world, the evil that has been done to us causes us to feel so angry. I know it happens, but I just want to encourage us that we need to move away from anger. The second point that I want to make as to why we should root out anger, root out, root out our sense of, of, of rivalry, is because rivalry breeds like a virus. It breeds like a virus. I want to just quote from you the article, What Are Viruses and How Do They Work? by Taylor McNeil. It describes viruses like a coronavirus like this. They are not even alive. Number one, anger not alive. If it's not inside of you, it don't adhere. They're not even alive. Viruses gain their power by worming their way into living cells, quickly hijacking the cells machinery, then reproducing like mad. Soon they are spilling out into the cells, infecting them too, and sometimes spreading across the world. I want, I want you to watch an infection in the Cain story. So, so here we go. So Cain sees that his... His, his sacrifice is not accepted. And let's just watch how it gets out of control. So Cain sees that his gifts are not accepted. So it affects the way he feels. Watch how you're feeling. He feels jealous. He feels upset. He feels angry. He feels resentment. He feels pride instead of humility. Now watch how it's affecting his thinking. He thinks his brother is to be blamed for the situation. He thinks his brother is his enemy. He thinks he can abdicate his responsibility to his brother. He thinks that getting rid of his brother solves the problem. Ah, now watch it mushrooming. Watch the way he acts. He ignores God's warning. He speaks to God disrespectfully. He deceives his brother. He deprives his brother of his life. He lies. He destroys his own life. James 1, 14 to 15 tells us these desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow... It gives birth to death. Genesis 4, 7. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. I want to encourage us to check ourselves because we want to root them out. I don't know if you remember the Sunday school song. Root them out. Envy, jealousy, malice, and pride. There's so many of these the vices. We want to root them out. And then the third reason why we don't want to take the route that Cain took is because when rivalry shows up, something's going to die. When rivalry shows up, something's going to die. That is the reality. Genesis 4, 5, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look over. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Rivalry came, love went. Rivalry came, integrity went. 
Rivalry came. Self-control went. Genesis 4-8. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked him and killed him. Rivalry came. Cain's sense of responsibility for his brother went. Today I want us to just take a moment to ask ourselves, what's going? What are we losing as a result of rivalry? And if you're here and you're saying, well, Yvonne, I hear, you know, what will we do? I believe what the Lord is saying to us today is, no, I don't want you to raise Cain. I want you to raise the mind of Christ. I want you to have the mind of Christ. And, and what does the mind of Christ do for us? The mind of Christ says love, says peace, says patience. The mind of Christ says, as Colossians 3.10, the mind of Christ allows us to put on our new nature. Colossians 3.10 says, put on your new life and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. And how is he? How does he roll? Well, Psalm 103 verse 11 tells us, for his unfailing love towards those who fear him is great as the height of the heavens above the earth. He rolls with love. Psalm 103 verse 8 tells us, the Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. If only we knew how he loves us. If only we knew that we are prototypes in his kingdom. One you. Nobody else like you. There is no reason for rivalry. But today, if your home, your relationship has been broken or touched or bruised or hurt by rivalry, I want you to know that the Lord can make a difference. God can heal wounds. And so I just want to invite you to close your eyes with us and just pray this prayer with me. Father, Father, we thank you that you are merciful and full of love. We thank you that you are tender and caring. We thank you that you are able to forgive and repair and empower. And so we pray, Lord, that you would cause the mind of Christ to be born in us again and again and again as you sanctify us over and over and over, Lord, and make us more like you. Father, we yield our cane, Lord. We stop raising cane, Lord. We want to raise, oh God, and we want to have the mind of Christ. Oh, Father, continue the work that you've started in this conference. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you.